Mayor Olivia Chow apologizes to the Jewish community for missing an October 7th vigil in Toronto. We have the latest reaction tonight. And police believe that a stolen vehicle was involved in a fiery crash involving two TTC buses. We're going to tell you more. And powerful winds from Hurricane Milton begin lashing Florida. We'll tell you how it's impacting operations at Pearson. And William Osler apologizes to the family of an elderly sick man after his beard was shaved without his consent. This happened while he was unconscious at Brampton Civic Hospital. You're watching Live at Five. Good evening, I'm Bakari Savage. And I'm Lena Latifat. Thank you for joining us here on Live at Five. Mayor Olivia Chow is facing questions and criticism after missing an October 7th commemoration event on Monday. The mayor is saying she regrets not being able to be there. And CP24's Beatrice Vaisman joins us live with the details from City Hall. Beatrice. Lena Bakari, this morning we heard that the mayor and her staff simply did not receive the emails from the Canadian, uh, the Centre, pardon me, for Israel and Jewish Affairs. This afternoon we're getting the first apology from the mayor saying, I regret that I missed the memorial hosted by UJA and Sija this week. I should have been there. I am sorry. Earlier this morning she said that she did regret uh, not attending the event, though Sija and the VP of the organization refute the mayor's claims that she was not invited or that she wasn't asked multiple times to attend. In fact, the VP of C just saying three different emails were sent. The first two were mass blast newsletters that were sent to various elected officials. Seems everyone got those except for Mayor Chow. The premier attended. Councillors Matlow, Cole, uh, Sachs were among those in attendance. Pasternak as well. Uh, Liberal leader Bonnie Crombie was there. A slew of MPPs and cabinet ministers from Premier Ford's government. Liberal MPs as well. Uh, but the mayor saying somehow her invitation got lost. In fact, Sija is saying a third uh, personal message was sent to the mayor's staff, specifically to her executive assistant, uh, asking if the mayor would attend. And now the mayor's office is saying that essentially IT is looking into how this could have happened. Here's what the VP of Sija told us here on CP24. The apology is not enough. We really would, you know, she has said that she is going to reach out to our office to take a meeting with us, and we still have not heard from her office with respect to a meeting. And so we do look forward to having a meeting with her. And, you know, any sh anything short of taking some leadership to and directing police to try to put a stop and reduce all the hate crimes, which are up by 75 percent, that's data that came out just yesterday against the Jewish community. She needs to take some leadership and action, and an apology is just not going to be good enough without some concrete action from her. Uh, late this afternoon in that same statement I mentioned first thing this uh, at the top of uh, our conversation here, the mayor's uh, spokesperson telling CP24 that new points of contact have been created with CJA and the UJA uh, to make sure that no important emails are missed going forward. Uh, the concern is uh, the mayor's story has kind of changed over the course of the day as well. This morning on News Talk 1010, she also mentioned that she was at a meeting about bike lanes along the Kingsway, that it went late, that she was exhausted. And then Councillor James Pasternak telling us here on CP24 that he personally asked the mayor in the weeks leading up to October 7th if she would be at the memorial event. He says that she told him she'd have to look at her calendar. I asked Councillor Matlow for his thoughts on the mayor not attending the memorial. And here's what he had to say. I didn't actually consider which councillor or mayor or other politician would be there. I, like, I, didn't, I didn't ask them. I didn't, that, wasn't, that wasn't my focus that evening. My focus was as you know, personally and professionally to be there with a community that had been traumatized and needed to know that there are people in leadership roles who understand the pain that they are going through, the vulnerability that they feel. Councillor Pasternak and Councillor Bradford as well, who was also there, mentioning that the mayor's absence was noticed by members of the Jewish community who were there at the memorial as well. As for the mayor, she's now committed to meeting with CJ and UJA, as her statement said, uh, to try to work forward, not to cast blame, not to go back. She apologized, but now how do we work forward in making sure that her relationship with Jewish organizations and Jewish community members can be strengthened from here on in?
Back to you. All right. Beatrice Faisman at City Hall this afternoon. Thanks so much, Beatrice. Well, on News Talk 1010 this morning, Mayor Chow was asked why she didn't visit the police officer who was shot and injured last week in Midtown. Yeah, she explained that she was attending the farewell gala for Toronto Fire Chief Matthew Peck. I immediately called the chief of police. Uh, we sent, we put out a statement, and it just, I can't, in the middle of, say, the fire chief that have done such incredible work, he put, like, 34 years award-winning uh, fire chief that I, I can't, you know, in the middle of his event, before he speak, I get up. And he didn't speak till 10.30, um, so... By the time I finished that night, it was 11.30. Well, Clayton Campbell, the new president of the Toronto Police Association, responded to Mayor Chow's comments with a post on X. He questioned her support for the injured officer, pointing out that she did not visit the hospital or the officer's division and did not reach out to him directly to see how he was doing or thank him for his service. Well, an extension of the runway at Billy Bishop Airport is on the agenda at City Council today. And there's also a question of extending the lease of the Waterfront Airport. OK, right now, let's bring in CP24's Lindsay Biscay, who continues to follow this, which is happening at Council as well. Lindsay. Exactly. And this has been debated for hours now, uh, Lena and Bakari. And important to note, the two things Lena mentioned off the top are true. What's not true is the debate about the future of the island airport, whether it should be closed, whether it should remain open. Uh, some councillors continue to be focused on that today, but that is not up for discussion. Now, I want to be clear here that Transport Canada has put in some new regulations that make sure all airports in Canada have an extension of their runway by 2027. Uh, that would be 150 metres of safety distance at the end of a runway. And so that's really up for discussion today in terms of whether option one, option two or option three would work best for the city to get this done within the next three years or so. Voting has begun now, so there's a couple of motions that have been put forward and carried. So Mayor Olivia Chow put forward a motion to pick option one. It did sound as though she was swaying that way today uh, and would also allow a lease extension through 2045 if deemed necessary to finance the safety improvements. Uh, that did carry 17 to 8, but another motion was then put forward that uh, makes a commitment to a long-term lease extension come after that runway work has been finished. That also carried 16 to 9. So it looks as though uh, the city might be picking option one uh, and then looking at that lease extension, which Ports Toronto has been pushing for afterwards. So a lot to go over here. We were hearing from councillors earlier today about, you know, which option to choose, how to get the work done as fast and as cost effective uh, as possible. And here's what they had to say. Have a listen. I think you always have to plan ahead. The problem with government, and often this government, in terms of City Hall, I don't mean that particularly in, in terms of the mayor, is that we don't plan ahead. And then, you know, when it comes to ferries, we're behind the eight ball. So we do need to plan ahead. Uh, I'm totally in favor of expanding the, the runway as per our, the safety requirements and also continuing with the lease of the airport. Like, let's not play games. Let's show, show some leadership. We don't have a mandate to make a decision today about the long-term future of the airport. We haven't consulted the public. We haven't done the work we need to do. We can't answer the questions. We cannot do that today, but we should make a schedule for getting onto the decision. Okay, so once again, voting underway as we speak. Lina and Bakari, it sounds as though uh, the, the kind of first decision is to go with option one that has the least kind of frills and bows attached to it. It was what city staff recommended the city go with. They did not recommend looking at a lease extension with Ports Toronto right now. But of course, as I said, Ports Toronto pushing for that. Uh, if we do get through this today, obviously city council meeting continues and up for debate next would be the congestion management plan. That is something else that city council uh, will be looking at over the next couple of days. Back to you. All right, CP24 is Lindsay Biscay with an eye on Billy Bishop, also Toronto City. Thanks a lot, Lindsay. A TTC driver is being held for their quick action to pull a driver from a burning car after an early morning crash. This viewer video shows the burning car at Bathurst and Eglinton. The car, believed to be stolen, was involved in a collision with two buses. The crash happened just before 5 o'clock this morning. The driver taken to hospital with serious injuries. One of the bus drivers and two passengers on the bus were taken to hospital with minor injuries. It is alleged that the Honda motor vehicle was traveling at a high rate of speed eastbound on Eglinton Avenue West and struck a northbound TTC bus that with such force that it actually struck another TTC bus. 
Uh, what happened at that point is the Honda motor vehicle uh, burst into flames. Marvin Affer, chair of the ATU Local 113, told CP24 about the rescue by the driver. With a situation like this, we're proud to say that this operator, when talking to him, uh, recovering in the hospital right now, that he didn't have time to think. He just acted. He saw somebody, regardless of how the event occurred, that this vehicle apparently that was stolen crashed into his bus. He felt the heat of the uh, burning vehicle right away. Uh, while he was injured, he got out of the vehicle to help save their life. The motorist was apparently uh, unconscious or semi-conscious, and pulling them out at his own risk and peril, he stood up and did what he could to help save a life. We continue to do that. We are the eyes and ears of the system, and we do appreciate being the eyes and ears of the city as well to repeatedly do what we can to help people. Investigators say officers were not pursuing the car at the time of the crash. Right now, it is 5, 10, 12 degrees. Let's get a check on that 5 o'clock commute with... Adjoa and Siayabwa, how is that drive looking, Ed? You know, it's uh, very slow going. It's a crawl. It's rush hour to be expected. And in the mix, a couple of problems adding to the drive, making it slower, especially if you're on the uh, QEW Toronto bound. You've really had uh, no relief. Really slow from Erin Mills Parkway. Continues slow out towards about uh, here, Ontario. My camera went out, but it is a collision that's longstanding. It's still in that left lane. Headed towards uh, the Gardner. As I said, it's rush hour, so it's extremely busy as you make your way out of and head into the downtown core. And also looking at uh, major delays on the 401 as you navigate across the top of the city. But it looks like all earlier issues have cleared. On city streets, a couple of problems. Pretty serious collision blocking lanes on Kingston Road and Kingswood and Scarborough. Also a collision blocking lanes on the Lakeshore and 30th Street. I'll send it back to you both. This CP24 traffic report is brought to you by 407 ETR. Enjoy the journey with a stress-free commute. It is now 511, 12 degrees. You're watching Live at 5. And we are live at Pearson Airport. The sewer flights to and from Florida, they've been impacted by Hurricane Milton. We're going to hear from some passengers after the break. An apology today from William Osler Health System after an elderly sick patient was shaved without consent or for medical necessity at Brampton Civic Hospital in August. We're going to bring in CP24's Phil Perkins for more on what steps Osler is taking in response to this incident. Phil. Hey there, Bacar and Leah. Yeah, just to recap to let people really kind of bring them back up to speed on what happened here. It happened a couple of months ago. So back in August, 85-year-old Joginder Singh Kaler was at St. Michael's Hospital. He underwent a procedure uh, in the facial area after a fall. And at that moment, during that procedure, the beard was kept where it was. It was not shaven. It was not touched. At one point, he was then transferred to Brampton Civic Hospital, which is run by William Olser Health. The, the medical staff there asked the family, do or do they give consent to them shaving the beard? They said no. And then you see what happened on the right there. It was indeed shaven, that it goes against uh, the sick religion, the shaving of that beard, of the hair. So they have said sorry. We're going to read that statement, but we actually got a, a statement from the family themselves. So this is just in the last half hour or so. So they have said, this is according to the William Osler uh, apology. This is them reacting to it. They say, the apology statement put out by the hospital is accepted by the family. For sure, we would like to see the hospital do what they promised to do with educating their staff and make sure this type of incident doesn't occur in the future with another practicing sick or any other member of another faith. Now, let's read out the apology from William Olzer. This is the first half. There's two, but I'll read the first half this half hour. They say, quote, recently, we failed to uphold the religious and cultural care practices when a sick patient... Uh, their beard was shaved without consent and without medical necessity. Again, this procedure was done at St. Mike's, not at Brampton Civic. They say we take full responsibility for the incident and have extended our deepest apologies to the patient and his family. And they also say they're going to be consist consistently working on religious and cultural practices, teaching their staff about that. Now, we also heard from Balpreet Singh. He is a lawyer for the World Sick Organization of Canada. This is what he had to say about the entire ordeal. When someone comes in, uh, they should be asked explicitly if they have any religious practices that medical staff should know about. And when it comes to something like this, there should be something that's visible, either on the file or on the bed or somewhere else. And secondly, we need to make sure that there's education, ongoing education for physicians and staff. Uh, Brampton is home to the largest sick community in Canada. So uh, it just makes sense that they should know how to treat sick patients. And again, just to, to tie this up in, in, in a good way, though, we got the apology, but we also understand uh, that Mr. Kaler is doing well in terms of health.
Back to you guys. All right. Phil Perkins reporting live from our newsroom tonight. Phil, thanks so much for this. No problem. Well, Hurricane Milton, all eyes on that, is hitting the west coast of Florida with rain, tornadoes, and tropical storm force winds as it continues its steady march toward that state. Well, Milton has fluctuated in intensity as it approaches Florida, now being a Category 3 hurricane with the same winds. Close to 210 kilometers an hour. So the National Hurricane Center is not certain where the center will actually make landfall tonight. But the entire Tampa Bay region and Point South are considered at grave risk. So it is expected to remain a hurricane after hitting land and plowing across the state, including the heavily populated Orlando area. That's through tomorrow. Well, people continue to arrive at Pearson Airport from Florida. CP24's Andrew Brennan has been speaking with those fleeing the approaching hurricane. Andrew. Yeah, Bakari, right now we're, just, and, and Lena as well, of course, we're trying to see who could be coming from the last direct flight that is coming from Florida today. That's from Fort Lauderdale. It got in just after four o'clock. We've been at the arrival section seeing if anyone's coming from there or if anyone's been trying to get here otherwise, because we've heard from people today that they couldn't get out when they were trying to go to, say, Miami or Tampa uh, and unable to get a flight from Fort Lauderdale. Even so, they drove, for instance, all up to Atlanta, Georgia, and they got a flight from there. And right now, we're going to see if we can get anyone else. But in terms of other things to bear in mind, is there are of the flights that were leaving this afternoon for anywhere in Florida, all were canceled. The last one was a Fort Lauderdale flight at 4:15. That was canceled within about three hours from when it was supposed to take off. But there were people that flew out this morning, and some of the connecting flights for people that were heading to Florida for instance, were cancelled midway through the day. So those people would theoretically be stranded in Montreal or the Northeast right now. We did ask the people earlier on what uh, they were feeling and here's some of what they told us. I've been through a lot of times so, where uh, for me, while well, watching the system, uh, it's, it's not uh, so so bad for me. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, what are you hearing from people in the area? Have you heard from any of your neighbors oh. or friends? Well, yeah, for uh, my community, everything is great. It's all out of our control. I have my family down in Florida. It's a special occasion, so I'm. my grandchildren are there, my daughter, yeah. her husband, okay. and I have to make my way there. Yeah. Have, has your flight been impacted at all? No, like not at all. Now, there's already airlines that have canceled flights outright uh, for at least tomorrow and looking ahead from there. Uh, Air Canada does have some that are expected uh, that are scheduled to operate. But as I mentioned with that Fort Lauderdale flight not long ago, Lena Bakari, they could be canceled through the night. The airport is reminding people to look at their phone apps and uh, look at notifications from the airlines and then plan accordingly. Back to you both. Okay, live at Pearson Airport, CP24 is Andrew Brennan. Andrew, thanks a lot. With that, it's now 519, 12 degrees. This is Live at 5. Well, coming up, the puck will drop on the Leafs' new season on the road tonight when they take on the Canadians in Montreal. We're giving you a live shot of Scotiabank Arena tonight. We'll be right back with more. Okay, it's that time of year again. The Maple Leafs are in Montreal tonight to kick off the regular season. Yeah, they had a quick tune-up yesterday at the Ford Performance Center in Etobicoke. This was right before hitting the road. The Buds, they're playing their first two games of the 2024-25 campaign on the road before returning to Toronto for Saturday's home opener against the Pittsburgh Penguins. Stolars will start. I, uh, was that uh, we'll experience some lower body tightness yesterday it's precautionary so we're going to keep him out tonight will he play tomorrow uh, we'll see tomorrow so uh what have you liked about what you've seen from Stolarz? obviously he's yeah i thought he had a solid game uh, in detroit right and uh, even before that is you know practices and things like that he's big guy obviously takes up a lot of net but uh he looks very confident to me in net right now Okay, well, she couldn't make it to Montreal, but CP24, <laughs> CJ Lou is outside of the home of the Leafs tonight, talking to some fans about their hopes for the upcoming season. What can you share about some of those conversations, some of the excitement, CJ? 
Uh, it would have been great to be in Montreal, but hey, Maple Leaf Square is very exciting as well. Uh, we spoke to some fans and they are saying they feel hopeful. They feel like how they do every season, but every year is the year until it's not. But the Leafs, they're kicking off their season with their arch rivals, the Montreal Canadiens in Montreal tonight at the Bell Centre. Puck drops at 7 p.m. The Leafs are coming into the season with a whole lot of changes, including a new head coach and Craig Berube, a new captain with Austin Matthews and a revamped defense. This is all in hopes of a very different outcome in the playoffs. Uh, but like you heard, it is a bit of a deja vu for fans tonight with goaltender Joseph Wall off uh, tonight with an injury. Anthony Stolarz in as well. We spoke with Nick Alberga earlier today. He is the host of Leafs Morning Take. He helped us tee off tonight's game, including how a new coach might make a difference for the Leafs this year. Take a listen. Thing looking back to last season, I think they're in dire need of a coaching change. And Craig Bruby uh, brings a wealth of experience, but he also brings a wealth of a different sort of mentality to this roster. I think, again, they direly needed it, dating back to the Sheldon Keefe era. And obviously in 2019, the St. Louis Blues win the Stanley Cup. So I think accountability is a big word I would be looking for from this Maple Leafs roster moving forward. Uh, very curious as well to see, uh, you know, how players react to some buttons that are push, uh, pushed, I would say. Uh, by Craig Berube, but I think overall, I think there's excitement, there's optimism, positivity in the air because a new head coach is in the mix here. And positivity is and hope is what fans are feeling today as the start of a new chapter for the Leafs. Uh, kickoff, uh, puck drop is at 7 p.m. today, but all the action will be here in Toronto Saturday night when they host their first home game against Pittsburgh, and that is also at 7 o'clock. Back to you guys. Yeah, as you said, CJ, it's a brand new chapter. Thanks so much for this. It is 525, 12 degrees. You're watching Live at 5. The condo inventory is on the rise in the country. This is according to a new report. We'll take a closer to look next. Welcome back. A new report shows condo inventory is on the rise in this country. Remax Canada found that condominium inventory it rose in most major markets from January to August. So the GTA had the second highest year over year growth at 52.8 percent. Sales in the region slipped by more than 8 percent. The GTA was also the only region where average prices declined year over year, falling almost 2% to roughly $732,000. I think now, after the last 24 months, we finally hit bottom. Okay. And in spite of all the challenges, it's a really good time if you're looking for uh, to purchase a condo right now. Lots of inventory. Rates are coming down. There's all kinds of relief now for first-time home buyers, which have been just decimated over the last uh, several years with stringent lending policies and higher rates. Mm -hmm. Remax has said it expects pent-up demand to fuel stronger market activity by spring, but warns Toronto could be the last market to emerge from sluggish conditions. It is now 528, 12 degrees. This is Live at 5. And we'll go live to Montreal next, where the puck will drop on the Leafs' new season. It's on the road tonight, and they take on the Canadiens. Mayor Olivia Chow has apologized for missing an October 7th vigil in Toronto. We're going to have the latest reaction. Well, police believe a stolen vehicle was involved in a fiery crash involving two TTC buses. We'll tell you more. And powerful winds from Hurricane Milton begin lashing Florida. We'll tell you how it's impacting operations at Pierce. You've been watching Live at 5. <laughs> Good evening. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Lena Latifat. I'm Bakari Savage. The Maple Leafs are in Montreal tonight to kick off the regular season. Let's go live to TSN's Mark Masters, who's in Montreal ahead of puck drop. Mark, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, lots of changes to make this year. This could be the year. Uh, let's start with Austin Matthews. He's a new team captain. Is this the leadership, the cohesion on the ice to bring home the Stanley Cup? What difference uh, would a Matthew captaincy make? 
It's always hard to kind of tell with that sort of stuff, you know. He, he says he's not going to change his approach. He's going to stay the same guy. Uh, I think the team is hoping that he'll be emboldened at certain moments of the season and in the playoffs to speak up and take ownership and that the way that he carries himself, kind of this cool customer will maybe translate more to his teammates than it has in the past. So it's hard to put your finger on it, but the Leafs do believe it will make a difference. Okay, along those lines, Mark, we have to talk about this. Lena, you, you almost had it. We said the year. The year. We're talking about <laughs> the year. So, Mark, you know, there's also a new coach. Talk about the difference that that's going to make. Will that be the difference to make this the year? Yeah, I think it, it definitely makes a difference. For, for the first thing, uh, he's going to have the team playing a different system, more north-south, more dumping in the puck, chasing it, playing physical, playing a grind game. So that will be different. And Craig Brube is a guy who's won a Stanley Cup. So he comes in with instant credibility. He's known as a very good motivator, good at holding these players uh, to account. So he is expected to make a difference. Uh, I want to talk about how this season feels. Mark, you've covered so many uh, throughout your career. Does the season feel different? It does feel different because of what we've just talked about. New captain, new coach. There is change in the air, even though the core players have returned. So it absolutely does feel different. We'll see how long that, that feeling lasts. But for now, at this moment in time, it does feel different. Okay, look, Mark, it doesn't matter, you know, what changes are made if the players are not healthy. We've got to talk about that. Yeah, Joseph Wool is out of this game. He was supposed to be the starting goalie. I mean, goaltending such a huge position. Uh, the Leafs have a lot of belief in Joseph Wool. They gave him a three-year contract extension during the summer. He spent a lot of the summer working on body stability, biomechanics to try and try and prevent future injuries, prepare for a bigger workload this year, and now he's unavailable because of lower body tightness, and Anthony Stolarz will get the start in that. He was very good in the preseason. He was the backup on the Florida Panthers team that won the Stanley Cup last year. They like him, but still, that's kind of a tough, tough uh, situation to not have Wool available for this season opener. All right, TSN's Mark Masters joining us live from Montreal tonight. Mark, thanks so much. Good to be with you. Thanks, Mark. Okay, so from Montreal yep. to Maple Leaf Square, that's where we find... CB24, CJ Lou, she is outside Scotiabank Arena. Uh, you've been speaking with fans about their hopes for the upcoming season. What are you hearing? Well, Leafs fans are certainly excited for this season. They are ready to enjoy the ride, even if it is an emotional ride. I have a very young fan here with me, Quinlan, who is all decked out in Maple Leafs clear, clearly ready for the season. Quinlan, it is the start of a new season tonight. How are you feeling? I'm feeling excited. Uh, I think the Leafs can do good this season and um, make it past the second round. I love that. I think all Leafs fans are looking forward to that. Uh, tell me about why you like the Leafs so much. Uh, well, when I was little, um, uh, I couldn't stay up that late, and the Leafs were always the early game in Calgary, so I always watch them before I go to bed. That's awesome. Quinlan and his family, they're visiting us from Calgary right now, clearly uh, here to see the Leafs. They also went to the Hockey Hall of Fame. Um, so you went to the Hockey Hall of Fame. What was your favorite part about that, and how is it getting you excited for the season? Uh, I think my favorite part of the Hockey Hall of Fame is probably getting to touch the Stanley Cup um, and seeing all the great players through history that are in there. I'm sure lots of people here would like to touch the Stanley Cup as well. Uh, you know, what would bring you back to Toronto again? You know, uh, would you come back here if there was ever a parade or, or a huge game? Yeah, and I'd like to come back with my dad. My dad couldn't come this time, so I'd like to come back with him next time. Awesome. Well, clearly the Leafs are getting a lot of fans excited, young and old. But the game uh, puck drop is tonight at 7 p.m. over in Montreal. But the action is right back here at Maple Leaf Square in Scotiabank Arena Saturday night when Leafs host their first home game against the Pittsburgh Penguins. Back to you guys. Right. CJ, thanks so much for this. 536, 12 degrees. Let's get a check on that drive home. Adjoa and C.A. Abwa keeping a close eye on that. Hey, Adj? Yeah, I am. And uh, still watching problems that have been with us for the last little bit. Happening on the QBW Toronto bound. Uh, this is just as you make your way past here, Ontario. It is going to be here for some time. Now it's just repairs to the guardrail on the eastbound QBW where the left lane is out for the situation. This is why you are running into that delay as you make your way through. Headed towards the Gardner. It's been a tough drive this hour trying to get out and head into the downtown core because of uh, obviously long-term road work. 
and because it is a busy, busy afternoon. And if your travels take you on the northbound lanes of the 404 DVP 404, delays extend from Bayview Bloor. They continue all the way up to the 401. Outside of camera view, getting word of problems now on the southbound 400. I saw the ramp to the eastbound 401. Crews dealing with a collision in the right lane and on city streets. Pretty serious collision has a third street blocked at the lakeshore. I'll send it back to you both. All right, thanks a lot, Edge. Welcome. With that, it's 537, 12 degrees, feeling more like 10 outside. This is Live at 5. Coming up, the woman charged in the murders of three people in Toronto, Niagara Falls, and Hamilton made a court appearance today. We'll have more. Stay with us. A woman's been taken to hospital with critical injuries. This is after being hit by a bus in the East End. Yeah, we're showing you a live shot from Chopper 24 this hour. Uh, This is near the scene near Kingwood and Kingston Road. Take a look. Toronto police say it happened just after 4 o'clock this afternoon. The pedestrian was struck by a bus and taken to hospital with life-threatening injuries. You can see that school bus in the middle of this scene here. Uh, Road closures are in place for this investigation. Police, you can see, have cordoned off the area. As this investigation continues, it looks as if they're speaking to a number of witnesses on the ground, obviously trying to piece this together. Stay with us for the latest on this developing story. Well, the man's been charged with murder. This is in the death of his father in Midtown. 36-year-old Andrew Joseph was taken into custody on Sunday after his father, 82-year-old Henry Joseph, was found dead inside a home a day prior near Glen Karen Avenue and Avenue Road. Joseph originally faced a charge of interference with a body, but it's since been upgraded to first-degree murder. Investigators are asking for anybody with information about Andrew Joseph's actions prior to October 5th to come forward. And the woman charged in the murders of three people in Toronto, Niagara Falls, and Hamilton made a court appearance today. A 30-year-old Sabrina Caldehar appeared virtually wearing a green jumper and a black head covering. She did not speak other than saying her name. Caldehar's lawyer telling court there are fitness concerns and she's filed for legal aid. She's facing two counts of first-degree murder and one count of second-degree murder. Police say the first homicide involving a woman in her 60s took place on October 1st at a home on Keel near Dundas. And police believe that the second and third homicides, which followed, those were random attacks. 47-year-old Lance Cunningham died in Niagara Falls. 77-year-old Mario Billich was stabbed in Hamilton at Caldehar is scheduled back in court October 17th. A TTC driver is being hailed for their quick action to pull a driver from a burning car after an early morning crash. Okay, this view of video, it shows the burning car at Bathurst and Eglinton this morning. The car, believed to be stolen, was involved in a collision with two buses. So the crash happened just before 5 o'clock this morning. The driver of the car was taken to hospital with serious injuries. One of the bus drivers and two passengers on the bus were taken to hospital with minor injuries. It's uh, through our investigation, and it's fairly obvious with the debris field that uh, it was traveling at a very high rate of speed. What we are asking for is the public's assistance. If they were in the area of uh, Bathurst Street and Eglinton Avenue uh, West, if they have dash cam video, or if somebody happens to uh, have a business along here that has video, we're uh, appealing for your assistance. And Marvin Alfred, chair of the Amalgamated Transit Union Local 113, spoke to us about the collision and rescue by the driver. We're grateful that the injuries that happened are somewhat limited and hopefully uh, continue to not be life-threatening to the innocent people involved. And until the investigation is done, we'll get a report uh, to identify what could be done. And I think police and the TTC will do a thorough report. But I'm glad to report the operator is somewhat stable in the hospital, um, dealing with some emotional effect as well as physical injuries. And he's grateful he's able to help. An investigator said that officers were not pursuing the car at the time of the crash. Well, Mayor Olivia Chow, she's facing questions and criticism tonight after missing an October 7th commemoration event on Monday. The mayor saying she regrets not being able to be there. She's also apologizing now. CP24's Beatrice Vaisman joins us live with the latest from City Hall. Beatrice. 
Bakari, late this evening, uh, the mayor's office received uh, releasing a statement in which the mayor says, I should have been there. I am sorry, adding that there was a miscommunication between her office and the organizers of the October 7th memorial, those organizers being the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs and the United Jewish Appeal. Uh, originally this morning, the mayor appeared on News Talk 1010 saying there was uh, some kind of a glitch whereby she didn't receive the invitation, although Sija refutes that claim, saying they, they sent three different communications to the mayor, the first two newsletter blasts that went to all of the uh, invitees to this memorial, and then they sent a person email to the mayor's executive assistant, the mayor's office, saying that email was also not received. Here's what we heard earlier today from the VP of CJ here on CP24. We were quite disappointed. The Jewish community was quite disappointed to see that she didn't show up. And we had, you know, extended an invitation on three separate occasions. And the first two, we weren't sure if she received it. So we followed up directly with her office, with her staff, specifically her executive assistant and scheduler to make sure that she did receive the invitation um, and it never was acknowledged. And so the community, it was very noticeable for the community that she wasn't present. We had about roughly 40 elected officials from all levels of the government, government who attended. And um, the fact that she wasn't there was quite disappointing. This morning on News Talk 1010, the mayor saying that night, Monday night, she was at a meeting about bike lanes on the Kingsway, that it went late, that she was tired. So that was the first course of explanation offered this morning. And then it became this issue about the email and the invite never being received. The mayor saying her IT team is now looking into it. The mayor right now on council floor is talking to Councillor James Pasternak, who actually told us here on CP24 that he personally asked the mayor in the weeks leading up to this event if she would be coming. She told him that she would have to look at her calendar. Meantime, other councillors in attendance, councillors Bradford, uh, councillor Cole, councillor Matlow, Sachs, in addition to Pasternak, uh, they all got the invite, as did Premier Doug Ford, Liberal leader Bonnie Crombie, various ministers from the Ford government, uh, and MPs from the Liberals as well. So a lot of frustration today, but here's what we heard from councillor Pasternak earlier this afternoon asked her whether she was uh, going to come uh, and uh, so so from that point of view I think I think the organizers of the event did everything they possibly could uh, to make sure she they knew uh, she knew they were she was welcome so they did their job and unfortunately this got I've been given a number of explanations this got uh, caught up in uh, in junk mail or, or some kind of IT uh, issue uh, and uh, the message didn't get through. And so you can again see live here, Councillor Pasternak and Mayor Chow having a conversation on the council chamber floor here. Uh, Councillor Brad Bradford said the mayor had 364 days to plan for this memorial to mark the one-year anniversary of the October 7th attack. So some frustration that the mayor's office saying that uh, it has now created certain contact points with both CJA and UJA to make sure no further important invitations or dates are missed by the mayor's office. Back to you. All right, Beatrice Vaisman reporting live from City Hall. And again, Mayor Olivia Chow uh, apologizing to the Jewish community tonight. Uh, Beatrice, thanks so much for this. Well, an extension of the runway at Billy Bishop Airport, that's on the agenda at City Council today. Council's also made a decision about extending the lease of the waterfront airport. Okay, so there's a couple of parts to this mm -hmm. story. We turn to see between the fours, Lindsay Biscaya, who's also following counsel for the latest with mm -hmm. this. Lindsay. Yeah, exactly. So that discussion has wrapped up after those votes, Lena and Bakari, and we have some preliminary decisions. So uh, we were looking at three different options to expand, extend, extend rather the runway at Billy Bishop Airport. Uh, this is something that Transport Canada has, says must be done by 2027, a minimum of 150 meters of safety distance at the end of a runway. This is for all major airports in Canada. Uh, and so there was three options in terms of how to do this. Uh, city staff did recommend option one, which had kind of a no frills attachment. It wasn't very fancy. It gets the job done uh, in a minimal amount of time. And council has now voted preliminary to pick option one. The other side of this is Ports Toronto was asking for a 40-year lease extension to get this work done. It says it's going to take a lot of time. You're going to have to fill in more of uh, the island to get more space for that extension. And it wanted a 40-year lease extension. City Council voted today to allow uh, for a 12-year lease extension if necessary after this work to extend the runway has been complete. Um, so those votes, those motions did carry, but not everyone entirely happy about this. We did hear from Councillor Brad Bradford afterwards. Have a listen. I tried to have Council take a position today 
that would say we support the long-term existence of this airport and the enabling factors that would allow us to do that, which of course is a long-term extension to the lease and a renegotiation of the tripartite agreement. And you know, you saw an amendment brought forward by the mayor's handpicked deputy mayor that punts it to after the next election. So it's very clear that this is uh, this is all politics. They didn't want to make this decision today. So some obvious frustration there today. Uh, I should mention as well, this was not a debate about the future of the airport, although it did keep getting brought up throughout these discussions. This was really just, OK, how can we get this extension of the runway built in the next three years? Because that's not a lot of time uh, and it needs to be done. It's regulated by Transport Canada. And so a decision has been made today. We'll have to wait and see what comes from that. There's other uh, topics on the agenda for City Council. Bakari and Lena, now uh, Council has moved on to the traffic congestion management plan in the city. Uh, and so debates and discussion are currently underway. About that, back to you. Okay, Lindsay, thanks so much. 549, 12 degrees. You're watching Live at 5. And coming up, William Osler apologizes to the family of an elderly sick man. This is after his beard was shaved without his consent. It happened while he was unconscious at Brampton Civic Hospital. An apology today from William Osler Health System. This is after an elderly sick patient was shaved without consent or for medical necessity. This was at Brampton Civic Hospital. It happened in August. Yeah, for all the details and the latest reaction now, let's bring in CB24's Phil Perkins for more on what steps Osler is taking in response to this incident. Phil, it's important to note uh, there was no need to shave this man's beard. Uh, no medical reason for that. Right, and, and that is what uh, William Osler said in their statement, and it also makes sense because if you take a look at the timeline of what actually happened here, before we start all this, for those who, the, who don't, are unaware in the Sikh religion, you don't cut the hair. You groom the hair, you don't cut the hair. It goes against their beliefs. So when 85-year-old Joginder Singh Kaler went to St. Michael's Hospital for a procedure on his face after going for a fall, they managed to complete that procedure without shaving his face. And then in August, he was transferred to Brampton Civic Hospital. That is run by William Osler. Uh, the medical staff there asked his family, uh, do they... Uh, allow for them to shave his face. They said, no, absolutely not. And then you see what happened in the right side of your screen there. They shaved his face to the horror of his family. Now, we did receive a statement from the family responding uh, to the apology. This is the most recent thing that has happened thus far. So this is what the family is saying uh, about this apology. They say, quote, the apology statement put out by the hospital is accepted by the family. For sure, we would like to see the hospital do what they promised to do with educating their staff and making sure that this type of incident doesn't occur in the future with another practicing sick or any other member of another faith. Now, here is the second half of the William Osler apology. They say, quote, the distress this incident has caused the patient and patient's family and the wider sick community, including our own workforce. Remember, this is at Brampton Civic Hospital that has profoundly affected us as an organization and beyond. Although we can't go back and undo what has been done, we are committed to learning from this and making changes to help prevent this from happening again. They talk about how they're going to be doing additional actions and, and working with their staff about being up to speed with the religious and cultural practices uh, of multiple uh, people, uh, faith followers. Now, Balpreet Singh is a lawyer with the World Sikh Organization of Canada. This is what he had to say about this entire ordeal. A mistake that's taken place can't be reversed. An apology can't fix it. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of pain, a lot of uh, shock. Uh, but the family has been brave, and they've been really insisting that, uh, despite what's happened to us, it's important that this doesn't happen again to someone else. Uh, and that's really what, as an organization, we're focused on as well. Yeah, just have to learn from this, and we do understand uh, that the Kaler family says that. Uh, their elder, the 85-year-old grandfather, is doing well in terms of health. Back to you guys. Okay, CP24's Phil Perkins with an important update. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's 555, 12 degrees. This is Live at 5. Well, seven tornadoes have already hit Florida in advance of Hurricane Milton. The latest on the storm system, that is coming up. Well, Hurricane Milton is hitting the west coast of Florida with rain, tornadoes and tropical storm force winds as it continues its steady march toward the state. Milton has fluctuated in intensity as it approaches Florida. It's now a category three hurricane with sustained winds near 210 kilometers an hour. The National Hurricane Center is not certain where the center will make landfall tonight, but the entire Tampa Bay region 
and Point South are considered at grave risk. It is expected to remain a hurricane after hitting land and plowing across the state, including the heavily populated Orlando area. That's through tomorrow. We had a chance to talk to some travelers at Pearson today. I have my kids and my family there, so I'm hoping we live in Boca, that it'll be fine, but I've been watching it very closely. Any impact to your area or, or your flight at this point? Not yet. Okay. Well, hopefully not. I really want to get back. Where are you traveling and, and would you be impacted at all? Fort Lauderdale. You're going to Fort Lauderdale. What, what's the latest there? Have you heard from anyone on the ground? I have. Well, I have heard that it's kind of just rain and lots of rain, which is fine. Yeah. Just praying that there's nothing more than that. So you're looking at live images from Florida as everybody prepares for this impact. Uh, we've heard from officials the message is evacuate, leave. If you don't, you could end up risking your life. And, you know, earlier we saw a lot of people standing outside. They're watching. This is yep. all that happens all during hurricanes. You're Thank watching you. Toronto's breaking news. CP24, thank you for watching.